Okay, we are about ready to get started now. So I want to welcome you all. I am Susan Ingalls. I direct Sustainable Furnishings Council, and I'm very pleased to welcome you to today's webinar, which is part of our What's It Made Of initiative, in which Dr. Arlene Bloom will explain to us the chemical class approach for healthier furniture and people and environment. And we want to hear from you on this subject too, but we have you all on mute. So please send in your questions and comments via the question box and we will get to those. To start with, I want to tell you a little bit about Sustainable Furnishings Council. We are, let's see, I have something going on here. There's, good. Um, I want to tell you a little bit about Sustainable Furnishings Council, which are, is we are in our 14th year now. We are a group of nearly 400 suppliers of materials, manufacturers of all kinds of furnishings products, stores, design firms, and importantly, environmental conservation organizations, all of which share a commitment to sustainability to transparency and to continuous improvement. And we as an organization support our members with a lot of information and guidance and resources like these uh, that you will be um, getting today. We also have, as an educational organization, a certificate program, Green Leaders, which you can take to become accredited as a professional who has some knowledge in this realm. So if you are interested in the kind of thing we're talking about today, please consider getting more involved with us, either with your company joining us as a member or yourself joining us for the Green Leaders course. Um, uh, and of course, you could do both of those things. We are concerned about the range of many topics that fall under the wide umbrella of of sustainability. It's a very general term. We use our initiatives to focus our work on uh, places where we know we in this industry can make the biggest difference. And one of those is our What's It Made Of initiative, which is to encourage transparency in our complex supply chains and to stick stimulate innovation towards the elimination of this handful of hazardous chemicals that are most commonly found in furnishings, a couple of which, the PFAS and the flame retardants Dr. Black is going to be talking with us about today. It is very important that we take in this information. Though all industry professionals have a lot of power, the truth is that those of you who are designers and retailers have the most power in the residential furnishings industry because you are influencing the decisions that your suppliers and the manufacturers make, and you are also influencing decisions that your customers, the consumers make. So we were very pleased to be asked by ASA ID to perform a survey to determine what designers know, even though few of you are hearing from your customers that they want your expertise about harmful chemicals. We know that they, that you want to use information um, about chemicals as you advise your cu uh, customers. So um, we know we learned the information you want to have. We learned where you want to go for information. We are pleased that you come to the Sustainable Furnishings website, not only for information about the, um, the questions you should be asking, but also for product. And 
this is the most important part. We asked you, what do you know in general about harmful chemicals? We got some general information and we dug deeper to ask you about specific chemicals, flame retardants, PFAS, VOCs like formaldehyde, the antimicrobials that have become so popular and PVC. And we found that in general, you have little and general information. So we are here to bring you expertise from the experts, including our friend, Dr. Arlene Bloom, who is a research associate in chemistry at UC Berkeley and is also the director of the Green Science Policy Institute. That is a source of very important information for us and many of you have been uh, directed by us to it. So Dr. Bloom, thank you so much for being with us here today and it work for a healthier world and healthier furniture and it's really an honor to be speaking to all of you i apologize for the av av glitch we have all had them um so i am a himalayan mountain climber uh in my past and uh the mountain that we'll see maybe in a minute annapurna one is the 10th highest mountain in the world uh, and it's considered actually the most dangerous and difficult one to climb, which fortunately I didn't know. Uh, back many years ago when I set forth with uh, the first women's team to attempt Annapurna, and um, we did climb it, and it set for me a model of trying to do really hard things and uh, moving step by step. And that's, I think, what we're all doing together moving towards really healthy, attractive, affordable, functional furniture. And uh, so we're going to be learning things today about climbing the mountain of healthy, healthier furniture and a healthier environment, which now that I'm older and my knees aren't so good, uh, I find this is very similar, working with a great team of people like Susan and all of you to achieve a really worthy goal. So my organization... Oh, and just to say, I, I wrote two books about my climbing. Uh, one is Annapurna Women's Place, and that's about the first American ascent and all women's ascent of Annapurna, and then Breaking Trail, A Climbing Life, um, how I got to Annapurna from a very overprotected childhood in the Midwest. And so much of my life, I, uh, I, was, I have a PhD in chemistry, but I took off a long time to climb mountains and raise a family. And um, after that, actually when I was in my 60s, was fortunate enough to found the Green Science Policy Institute. And we are PhD scientists who do scientific research. We publish papers. Um, we bring together decision makers from government, business, uh, uh, NGOs, academia. Some of the people on the call, I think, have been to our retreats. And then we communicate widely the results. And doing that, we help uh, affect government change and also purchasing change with manufacturers, retailers, big purchasers, and it's all towards the summit of a healthier world. So the reason that there's such a problem about chemicals is there isn't a lot of regulation. There's one law, the Toxic Substances Control Act that passed in the 70s, and at that point, all the chemicals in use, 62,000 of them were, were grandfathered, things like asbestos, uh, could not be regulated by the EPA. New chemicals, there was really no requirement for health data. So foods, drugs, pesticides, things that we put in our mouths and eat are regulated, but other chemicals really aren't. And a second problem is what we call the regrettable substitution problem. On the left, you see a flame retardant. This is commonly used in TV cases. Um, it's called DECA 10 bromo, 10 bromines, diphenyl, two phenyl rings with an ether bond. It's persistent, bioaccumulative, and toxic. 
If you have an old TV, your TV case might be 15% by weight, this chemical, and it does come out into dust and end up in you. And it's been phased out after years of research and advocacy. And then the replacement is the chemical on the right. The, uh, almost the same with a, an ethane bond instead of an ether with the same problems. So it's expensive to uh, phase out chemicals. So often a substitute is a very similar chemical. So what do you do about uh, tens of thousands of chemicals that we really don't know about? It, it seems unworkable. And our institute came up with the idea of sorting these chemicals into six classes which have similar function, similar structure, and similar harm. And if a chemical is in these classes, it doesn't mean you should never use them, but you should red flag them and say, are they really necessary? And um, the six classes are PFAS stain repellents we'll be talking about today, antimicrobials, flame retardants we'll be discussing, bisphenols and phthalates, some solvents, and certain metals. And as I said, if a chemical is in these classes, the question is, is it necessary? If you say to a mom, you can have a wonderful stain repellent carpet, but the chemical will be in your child's body uh, for years to come and on the planet forever, she might decide it's not necessary or it's not worth it. But if she thinks she really still wants this stain repellent white, I mean, sorry, a white shag carpet she can drop, you know, chocolate milkshakes on, then the question is, is there a safer alternative? And um, so that that's, so the six classes aren't necessarily don't ever use them, but put a big red flag on them and only use them if they're essential, if they're necessary. So the first class we're gonna talk about today are the PFAS stain repellents. And this class of chemicals all has a bond between carbon and fluorine. This is the strongest bond in the chemical periodic table and it's virtually impossible to break. It takes the energy of lightning to break this bond, and uh, it gives good properties like oil and water repellency, but since the bond will never break, these are forever chemicals. They last forever. So deciding to use a PFAS, you're using something that's gonna be on the planet a million years from now. And there's been a lot of current understanding of the problem. If you haven't seen the film Dark Waters, uh, check it out. It's a great new film about um, Rob Balot, an attorney we work with, who discovered a big PFAS contamination. He's played by Mark Ruffalo and his wife is Anne Hathaway, wonderful actors, very, very dramatic story. And um, that is the problem about PFAS, is they are very persistent. They never break down. They're in all of us. And they've been linked to two kinds of cancer, high cholesterol, obesity, immune suppression, endocrine disruption, and a lot of other health problems. And these are chemicals where for years, we have, a, again, a regrettable substitution problem. For years, the chemical used was called C8, eight carbons surrounded by fluorine, uh, extremely persistent, they bioaccumulate, they're toxic. After decades of scientific research and advocacy, C8 was phased out only to be replaced with C6. And if you use a stain repellent uh, now, uh, it's likely to be fluorinated, it's likely to be C6. Uh, they're equally persistent, they never break down, um, they build up in plants. Um, we're finding more and more about them to being toxic. They move faster and there are more of them, so they're harder to clean up. Um, so it's an, another regrettable substitute. Uh, the industry that produces them does a lot of advertising that um, C8 was the problem and C6 is completely safe. Uh, they have these arguments, like if you're a chemist, the argument that C6 is safe because it can't break down to C8 is a little funny. If you have six carbons, it won't break down to, to eight, but that doesn't mean it's safe. Um, so in 2015, um, we, we, we actually have monthly calls with about 100 scientists from all over the world who study fluorinated chemicals. We've had them since 2013. And we wrote a, a statement that was signed uh, by numerous scientists uh, to 
call on the world to stop to limit the production and use of the whole class of PFAS and develop safer non-fluorinated alternatives. And after we wrote the statement, we did a lot of communication about it. That's our model. And uh, if any of you are really interested in PFAS, which I am, I find it fascinating. Uh, there's a series by Sharon Lerner in The Intercept called The Teflon Toxin. That's just a series of great journalistic articles. And anyway, we at that time, there was an article of a lawyer who became DuPont's worst nightmare that uh, led to the moving dark waters. And based on all that communication, uh, the EPA set a level in drinking water, what was healthy for PFAS. And um, we wrote a paper tracing back to the sources. And it turned out we were able to calculate that 6 million people had PFAS contamination in their drinking water. And uh, as we study more and more, more and more people have the problem. Uh, sites are found with very high levels, manufacturing sites like Wolverine put Scotchgard on leather that was, scraps were dumped into fields and then a suburb was built on that. It was near Grand Rapids, Michigan. And the levels of these PFAS are 800 times the EPA health advisory. There've been lots of lawsuits. Um, this February, Wolverine, the manufacturer, paid fines of $70 million to the state of Michigan for contaminating the drinking water. And 3M, who sold, and, and then Wolverine uh, sued 3M, and 3M paid Wolverine $55 million. There's just a lot going on all over the country like that. It's very, very expensive to provide clean drinking water once there's PFAS contamination um, in North Carolina. There, um, there's a lot of contamination from a DuPont, now Camorce plant, and the cost of uh, carbon filtration, which filters out the C8, is $46 million and nearly $3 million a year to operate. And then uh, smaller molecules, you need reverse osmosis, and that's twice as expensive. So very, very expensive once you have PFAS in drinking water. And so PFAS are problematic and difficult to clean up. Prevention is preferable, and that is happening, and I'll give you some examples. Uh, carpets are the, have been, in the past, the largest source of exposure for children. And um, we started working with the carpet industry. They all came to one of our retreats in Berkeley and learned that they thought they'd gone solved the problem by switching from the C8 to the C6, but we had a lot of scientists explain why they hadn't solved the problem. And this was about three years ago, and the carpet industry all agreed that they would phase out um, all PFAS from carpets and rugs by January 1st. These were the major manufacturers, and, and they did. And we knew it had happened last year ago when Home Depot advertised they weren't gonna sell any carpets and rugs uh, containing any PFAS. So that was a big success story because that was the largest source of children's exposure from carpets and rugs. Uh, a lot of companies have phased out uh, the use of PFAS. Um, IKEA is someone who came to our retreats and in 2014 learned about the problem and then removed it from their products. Uh, Crate and Barrel heard that IKEA had done that and they did the same. Um, and these other companies all have faced out all PFAS, some of them because they were picketed by Greenpeace. We, we try to work with companies, explain the science, and, and encourage them to, to, to really reduce the use of, of harmful classes of chemicals. Uh, Europe is in the lead. The Nordic countries and uh, Germany have proposed that all unessential uses of PFAS uh, be phased out um, by 2025. So this is all good news. And indeed, um, a lot of products are moving away from PFAS, carpets, food packaging, uh, furniture, outdoor gear, clothing, and uh, firefighting foam, which has caused a lot of the contamination. Um, so the PFAS, because they're forever, again, you only want to use them if they're essential. Um, and I've now heard of studies that they don't even help that much with furniture soiling. And these studies haven't been published yet, but they're studies from Harvard and from some furniture manufacturers. So it's not clear how useful they are, but we know they're forever and they know they're harmful.
So if you get really interested in PFAS like I am, we have a website called PFAS Central. This comes from we have our 100 scientists who are always sharing information with us and we were sharing it with each other. We decided to share it with everybody. And so um, if you go to PFAS Central, uh, dot org or dot com i'm not sure which but i think put in pfas central uh you can have the latest news articles about pfas the latest science the policy also events and um if you go to the pfas basics there's a page called pfas free where we list brands and manufacturers that have products with no pfas um, communities which were drinking contaminated water for decades came to us and said, please, can you list brands that don't use PFAS? So um, if you go to PFAS Central, there's a green banner that'll take you to PFAS free. But if any of you have lines of furniture that contain no PFAS, and you say that somewhere on your website, we, we, we don't check, but we ask people to state on their website that lines, doesn't have to be all your products, but if you have lines of products that are PFAS free, uh, please write us and uh, we'll be glad to uh, list you on our PFAS free page, which um, gets a lot of hits, and, and I hear people, people find it very useful. So now I'd like to talk about flame retardants. Um, in the 1970s, there were lots of fires, and people put flame retardants in children's sleepwear, furniture, baby product foam, building insulation, electronics cases, and no one said, um, are these chemicals harmful and do they provide a benefit? And in many cases, they are harmful. And in many cases, they do not provide a fire safety benefit. And we will learn more about that. Uh, my experience with flame retardants began back in the 70s when um, children's sleepwear was 5 to 10% by weight. Uh, the fabric was a flame retardant called brominated tris. And we found a little girl who'd never worn pajamas with Tris in them. Her mom bought her pajamas in the UK. Uh, we put her in the Tris treated pajamas and collected her urine. And the next morning uh, found Tris breakdown products that were known cancer causing chemicals in the little girl's urine. And we determined that this chemical Tris um, change DNA was likely to become cause cancer. So we wrote a paper in science and I put in the title because that's what we do at our institute. We write papers that can have impact. And uh, the subtitle, the main flame retardant in children's pajamas is a mutagen should not be used. The title, flame retardant additives, is possible cancer hazards. The paper was published back in January of 1977. And only a few months later, April 1977, the Consumer Product Safety Commission banned brominated tris from children's pajamas, which was a great thing. Um, and it only took three months. Things are a little tougher these days. Um, but when brominated tris was removed, the replacement was the regrettable substitute, chlorinated tris, which was nearly identical. And we did more studies, determined that chlorinated tris was also um, changed DNA, was cancer causing. It was removed from kids' pajamas back in 1978. But what we didn't know is that it was used in furniture. And uh, that is what started my new career. I started doing this about 14 years ago. We started our institute uh, after we learned that Tris was back in furniture. So an important thing to realize is it's flammability standards that drive the use of flame retardants in furniture. For flame retardants, it's all about standards. And a standard that you perhaps all heard about, Technical Bulletin 117, if we were live in a room together, I'd ask you to raise your hands if you've heard of TB 117, but I will assume maybe you have. And this was a California standard, a small open flame standard that was followed across the US and Canada. It required furniture foam to withstand a small open flame for 12 seconds but there was no significant fire safety benefit. And that might seem a bit surprising, but if you think about it, um, if you do a thought experiment and you mentally drop a candle on your couch, uh, the fabric's gonna burn first, you'll have a large flame, and with a large flame, the foam is gonna burn in just one or two seconds, 
And burning foam with flame retardants, it's a much smokier fire, it's more toxic, it's more dangerous. So this standard actually did not provide a fire safety benefit. Um, the chemical that was used to meet the standard is a chemical called PentaBDE, and I don't have much time to go into detail. Um, it's the second molecule down, and um, that's what it looks like, and it's halfway in structure between a PCB and a dioxin. And PCBs and dioxins are both known to cause cancer. They're very harmful chemicals. They're persistent. And now we can ask, why were we making our furniture foam 5% by weight, this PentaBDE that looks halfway between a PCB and a dioxin? Um, back when the data was public, that was a long time ago, 98% uh, of the use of this chemical, PentaBDE, was in the U.S. and Canada. And it has been found to be cancer-causing, causes a whole range of serious health problems. Um, and if you look at breast milk levels of PBDE, um, they're much higher in the U.S. than anywhere else, and that's because of the California Technical Bulletin 117 standard. And then countries that buy things from the U.S. also had high levels. So one of there have only been I think 23 chemicals globally banned under the Stockholm Convention in I think 135 countries, and PB, Penta BDE is one of them. So it's one of the worst chemicals ever. And unfortunately, its use in furniture foam and children's products foam led to these very high levels in the US. So how do the chemicals get out? Um, they're what's called semi-volatile. So they're always moving out of furniture. They're heavy. They drop into dust. You have a little dust on your hand. You eat a sandwich. You eat PBDEs. Uh, cats groom themselves, they lick their fur, they have much higher levels than humans, 100 times higher, and then unfortunately toddlers, children who crawl in the dust, put their hands in their mouths, their levels are three to five times higher than their parents usually, and sometimes as much as 50 to 100 times higher, which is not a good thing because that's when their brains and reproductive organs are developing. Um, the PentaBD has been really well studied because it was used since the 70s in most furniture, 5% of the weight of the foam approximately. Um, and so we've done like a, a experiment on our whole population, like we're the experimental animals for this PBDE experiment. Uh, women with higher levels take longer to get pregnant, have more thyroid disease, um, have altered levels of thyroid hormones during pregnancy. So um, during, during periods the brain's developing, so their children can have lower birth weight, lower IQ, impaired attention, poor coordination. Uh, there have been calculations that the average uh, U.S. child has lost three or four IQ points on average due to the PentaBDE flame retardants um, in their mothers. Um, PBDEs were phased out, fortunately, in 2005 but the replacement was chlorinated tris, uh, the same flame retardant that we had gotten out of kids' pajamas. And chlorinated tris was uh, phased out for use in furniture in 2012, but if you made couches or have couches from, that were purchased between 2005 and 2012, you may well have chlorinated tris 5% or so in, in your foam. So as I said, this, um, Flame retardants were used to meet the standard called TB117, um, which gives a 12-second delay of ignition of the foam, bare foam. Um, flame retardants are needed. Um, the only way to have a test on bare foam to make bare foam not burn for 12 seconds is to add about 5% by weight flame retardants. So um, we started working on this when I got back to doing science and realized that you really wanted to stop, well, first we realized that most fires are caused by smoldering sources, which are cigarettes and electrical space heaters, and that smoldering fires can be put out without the use of flame retardants uh, pretty easily by using smolder resistant fabric. And most fabrics used in furniture, leather, and synthetics are just naturally smolder resistant, and they will stop smoldering fires. 
Um, if cottons and linens like IKEA uses require a, a, an inner liner, but n nothing too expensive or difficult to use. And uh, we realized that if we change TB117 to a standard, a smolder standard, um, it would improve fire safety because it would reduce smoldering fires in, in linens and cottons, but it would not require the use of flame retardants. And so we decided this would be a good thing to do, that we could modestly improve fire safety um, and could um, not have flame retardants that were in all of our furniture and in all of us contributing to health problems. So we decided, oh, oh that's right. And the other problem, as I said, with the flame retardants is remember they delay, but they don't prevent foam from burning. And when the foam burns containing flame retardants, there's more soot and smoke, more carbon monoxide and gases, and at the end, more cancer-causing dioxins and furans. So adding the flame retardants does not improve the fire safety, makes the fire more deadly, and of course, results in health problems for those people who end up with flame retardants in their bodies. The majority of fire deaths uh, are caused by inhalation of toxic gases. So that increase in gases does indeed make fires more deadly. So given all that, we decided to try to change to a smolder standard that would increase fire safety without flame retardants uh, with a state Senator Mark Leno and the support of um, the fire service who uh, a lot of firefighters have the kinds of cancer associated um, with exposure to dioxins and furans. So the fire service supported um, stopping the use of flame retardants in furniture, as did uh, the manufacturers who were working with us then, and certainly scientists, parents, uh, public interest groups, just about everybody supported this. And, and we had four bills in the California legislature uh, and they all failed. And why did they fail? Because of huge advertising campaigns. Our, our first bill came very close to passing that, and it would have stopped the use of uh, halogenated flame retardants, AB 706. Uh, this was part of a um, $7 million advertising campaign by Californians for fire safety and that they were Albemarle Chemtora and Israel Chemicals Limited, the manufacturers of the flame retardants. A journalist did research and discovered $23 million was spent on lobbying in Sacramento to prevent um, California from changing their standard to one that would increase, modestly increase fire safety without the need for flame retardants. So you can imagine that was quite frustrating. Um, as scientists, uh, we wrote papers. Uh, this is one where we looked at 100 couches and discovered the use of PBDEs had gone down after the standard, uh, after PBDs were banned, but the use of chlorinated tris had gone up. Uh, we did another study of 100 children's products and found that 85 of, 85 of them contained halogenated flame retardants, uh, like a baby changing mat that was 13% by weight chlorinated tris. And, and these are not products where there's a fire danger. So these papers really, as scientists, that was our way of changing things. They brought this information to a, a bigger audience. Um, we shared with uh, industry uh, back in, I think, about 2012. BIFMA wrote a position paper on eliminating uh, fire retardant chemicals in office furniture. Um, and I know that um, Susan's organization, your organization, yes. uh, the Sustainable Furniture Council, has a position paper also um, on stopping the use of flame retardant chemicals in furniture. So it was really mm -hmm. helpful to us to have the support of the industry. And um, we also had a, a movie made. If you haven't seen it, check out Toxic Hot Seat, uh, made by Jamie Redford, Robert Redford's son, and Kirby Walker. And uh, anyway, maybe some people you know will be in the film. It's all about furniture flame retardants and stopping their use. Uh, that really contributed to change, but the thing that changed everything was um, a series of, oops, let me go back to that. Let's see. 
if I can get that. There you go. A series, a series of um, articles uh, in the Chicago Tribune, uh, Playing with Fire, and the subtitle says it all. A deceptive campaign by industry brought toxic flame retardants into our homes and into our bodies, and the chemicals don't even work as promised. So this was a, a series of 10 front page articles. They're full of scandal. Um, this first one was about a hearing, one of the hearings where our bill was defeated. There was a burn surgeon talking about um, some baby, a baby who died because there were not flame retardants in the baby's crib. And then it turned out that the burn surgeon had just made up the story. This was like a complete lie and that he was paid hundreds of thousands of dollars by the flame retardant producers to tell the story. Um, so anyway, it's a, a lot of scandal. Um, it's quite fun to read. So I think you can find it on the Chicago Tribune website. And um, meanwhile, Again, I'm a hiker and a walker, and I ended up, luckily, one of the governor of California, his senior advisor, lived near me and had a dog and went walking in the hills. So I started walking with Jerry Brown's senior advisor. And in those days, anybody who walked with me got a big earful about flame retardants. I was a little bit obsessed because, you know, they were in, ever, they were in all these products. They were coming out. They were causing harm. And we couldn't seem to do anything. All our bills got defeated. The flame retardant industry, you know, spent millions. It, it was kind of terrible. So my friends were like, we'll go walking with you, but you have to promise you won't talk about flame retardants anymore because everybody was tired of hearing me. But then I started walking with Jerry Brown's senior advisor and he listened and he told the governor and the governor decided to try to find a way to change the standard. But he really couldn't because the flame retardant industry would have probably you know, spent a fortune advertising he was burning down the state. But after um, the series came out, he did change the standard. And if you buy furniture now, as you know only too well, uh, it does not contain flame retardants. Um, the new standard, it's called TB117-2013. It doesn't forbid the use of flame retardants, but people are given a choice. Um, we, we have occasional flame retardant calls with um, trade associations. And I remember when this was about to happen, um, someone asked somebody from the, foam, the polyurethane foam association, they said, if the standard changes so flame retardants are no longer needed, how long will it take you to get the flame retardants out of your foam? And uh, Bob Ludica, the wonderful Bob Ludica, who has passed on, who was the executive director of the Polyurethane Foam Association, said, we'll take it out overnight. Because for the foam industry, the flame retardants reduced the quality of the foam. It yellowed. They liked nice white foam with good quality. So they were very happy to remove flame retardants. And they did, even though they were not banned. But, but they, did, they, did, um, they did remove them. And uh, then a labeling law was passed. So California furniture and probably most furniture will contain a label whether or not there are added flame returns. And, and usually there are not. So it sounds like things are good now, but there are still efforts to put flame retardants back in furniture, often under the guise of what's called a barrier standard. And that's a large open flame standard met with barriers. But standards, aren't, they can't specify barriers. It's a large open flame standard. And uh, often those standards are met most economically with flame retardants. There's been a number of, of recent efforts. There was one from the National Fire Protection Association, NFPA 277. Canada had their task force, SB 131. I can't remember the number, but ASTM, I think, might well be working on an open flame standard for furniture. It seems like they often are. UL has been promoting barrier standards. So a lot of these are happening and continue to happen. Um, and the problem with open flame standards is they only protect against a very, very narrow range of fires. So the UK is currently the only place in the world that does have an open flame standard. And it's met with um, lots of flame retardants and or barriers. And it requires a couch to resist two pieces of burning newspaper. But if you have four pieces, it burns. And uh, so, so you're only getting a small range of protection 
for filling your couch with flame retardants. And I, I also heard that um, from Randy, I'm forgetting his last name, from Herman Miller, who uh, did the fire testing. And he said they would have couches that had to meet this very severe standard, TB133, that the cushion had to meet it. But if there was a dust ruffle on the couch and it caught fire, then it didn't matter if it met TB133, it burned. And often there's a piece of newspaper or a dust ruffle. So you're not necessarily getting a lot of fire safety benefit, even with a very severe standard, but you are getting a lot of flame retardants. Uh, and to meet an open flame standard, flame retardants are often used. Uh, sometimes they're used in the fabric, sometimes they're used in the barrier, sometimes they're used in the foam. So you often end up back with flame retardants. Um, if you think about fire safety, most things in our fire safety toolbox um, don't have a potential for harm. Uh, the introduction of self-extinguishing cigarettes has been a huge boon and the big decrease in smoking. That's greatly increased fire safety. Uh, fire safe candles and child safe lighters, smoke detectors and alarms, sprinklers, better fire codes, education, those have all really reduced fire danger. Um, furniture regulation. So the smolder standard, TB117-2013, has made a difference. But we question open flame standards. Um, TB117, TB133, the very severe standard, barrier standards. All of these are open flame standards that can be met with flame retardants that can harm our health. Um, and you know, we all have flame retardants in us. They are cancer causing. Um, I don't, I've recently had several friends die too young from cancer. And I don't think flame retardants were the reason necessarily. We don't know, uh, but they did. Everybody has them in their bodies and we know it doesn't help their health. So over the population, uh, the flame retardants that were used in furniture until um, till the California standard changed, which is really about 2014, um, they, they are in all of us, in pretty much all plants, animals, everywhere, and they're not making our health better. And, and in some cases, they are really contributing to a series of adverse health problems. So in California, the good news is the very severe standard technical bulletin 133 was repealed, I think thanks to the good work of BIFMA. Dave Panning at BIFMA really led the way for this. Um, it required open flame testing of upholstered furniture in offices and other high occupancy places. And there was a limited fire safety benefit and high levels of flame retardants. So this is really a good thing. And hopefully um, we are, we, furniture fires are not a big source of um, fire harm or fire death. Open flame ones are even smaller. And hopefully the days of open flame and barrier standards are, are, are over. So now I'm going to share my glamour slide. This is my most glamorous night of my life. Um, because I had helped change the California standard and people in Jerry Brown's office actually said that might have been the most important thing he did for the health of our country by by stopping the standard. He had actually enacted it. If you watch Toxic Hot Seat, there's a great scene with Jerry Brown where somebody points out to him that he enacted the standard when he was first governor in 76. And here he was, um, you know, getting rid of it. And he says, well, every standard needs a change after a few years. But anyway, uh, they give out 10 inductees into the Hall of Fame with a lovely gold medal. And there I am getting my gold medal. And uh, there was Robert Redford and Joan Baez and all kinds of famous people. So, and that all came from helping remove flame retardants from furniture, working with many, you know, which wouldn't have happened without um, the work of people like BIFMA and uh, the Polyurethane Foam Association. Um, the Sustainable Furniture Council was in support. So the furniture industry really made all this possible. So I'm going to conclude now. We'll have a few minutes for questions. Um, we send out newsletters once a month. 
uh, with updates on flame retardants and PFAS and consumer tips and other things of interest. Um, so if you go to one of our websites, um, there'll be a screen and you, you can sign up. Um, a good one is our six classes one, sixclasses.org or greensciencepolicy.org. Um, if you have any questions or you want to sign up for the newsletter, please write me and I will happily answer your question, but we can have some, some live questions now. And I'll just end by um, reminding you to do go to sixclasses.org and uh, the video, there are four minute videos. You can watch a four minute video on PFAS or flame retardants or any of the six classes. Somehow I'm not moving on the slides anymore. I'm not sure why. Okay. I think I have well, one or two. Or did it freeze? Okay. And we've got some questions, Arlene. So as we move on, um, one of the uh, questions is in, and thank you so much for this excellent information. I really, really appreciate all you've told us, but tell us more. Um, in general, are vintage furnishings more or less likely to contain contaminants than those from new production? I bet it depends on when they were made. Yeah, unfortunately. So I, of course, had the ca the highest level ever measured practically in my dust of that Penta BDE because I bought, you know, oh used furniture in graduate school and kept it. And um, so I threw away all my furniture and my daughter said, I can't invite friends home. We don't have furniture. So I, tr I went around <laughs> trying to find furniture from before 1970 six mm -hmm. and it wasn't pretty <laughs> finally yeah. someone gave me an organic couch yes uh, any furniture from 1976 until about 2013 would be problematic and um you you want to look for that label that says it's flame retardant free yeah good so antique new furniture should be fine all new the, the you know there was a few years where the supply chain was a little bit messy but mm -hmm. by now any new furniture will not contain flame retardants. So vintage is a problem. You can yeah. swap out the foam. You know, if somebody really wants a vintage couch, I would recommend getting new foam. Uh-huh, because they won't contain flame retardants in the foam in a new couch, but it might be in some of the fabrics, which um, leads us to this next question. I want to use natural fiber upholstery to create a biodegradable end of life for the furniture I specify. Are there studies on what fibers are most smolder resistant? Cotton, linen. I don't want to cause a safety issue, but I want to take a cradle to grave approach to selecting items for my clients. Well, cotton and linen are not smolder proof and they do not pass. Uh, TB1 was 7, 2013, so you wouldn't be able to sell it in California. Um, uh -huh. But but you can get a thin inner liner, like IKEA's furniture is mm -hmm. uh, cotton and linen, and they do sell it in California. But they have they have developed a, a thin um, inner liner, so you you have you have mm -hmm. to put something between the foam and the furniture if if you're using cotton or linen, and. Yeah. Um, I, you know, a kid, unfortunately, they don't share what they use, but I would suspect that others have solved this. And I have heard that some people uh, coat fabric with flame retardants to get around that. And of course, that would not be a good organic cradle to grave sort of fabric. So you want yes. uncoated natural fibers with, with a thin inner liner. Yeah. And of course, wool is smolder resistant and silk is um, no, not quite as much so as wool. And that thin inner liner can be a um, cellulosic, like a, a rayon. There's a rayon made from milkweed that um, that is used in by some companies. Um, here's the next question. I've seen data from 2011 and 2012 showing that the countries that spend the most on flame retardant chemicals per capita have the lowest deaths from fire compared to those countries who spend little on flame retardants who have the highest deaths per capita due to fire. 
What is your opinion on this correlation? I've never seen that data. It sounds like it's produced by the flame retardant producers to me. It doesn't sound, does not sound accurate at all. I'd love to see it if the person who has it could send it. Yeah. Um, so so that, unfortunately, the flame retardant producers have sort of come up with a bit of a parallel science. So they have some hired scientists who have, like the Chicago Tribune series, if you go to it, um, the 10th story is a long rebuttal of um, a really faked article by the flame retardant producers. So I, I'm sorry, I mean, I haven't seen it, so I don't know that it was funded by them or that it's uh -huh. inaccurate, but mm -hmm. things like that don't make sense to me. Um, and since there are, there, there are a number of those studies, I, I, would, I would, who knows, it could be one of those. Yeah. Okay, here's another question about um, flame retardants. What is your opinion on organohalogen flame retardant? Not all OFRs have been found to pose harm to human health, yet the NGOs strongly feel they should be prohibited entirely as a class. Well, um there have never been any organohalogens flame retardant study that were not found to be harmful. Mm -hmm. So at some point you have to say, let's red flag them and wait until there's proof that one isn't harmful before we use it. Mm -hmm. So the Consumer Product Safety Commission, um, there was a petition um, to not allow any organohalogen flame retardants in furniture or children's products. And the Consumer Product Safety Commission um, considered in great detail the science and decided that the petition was valid. It was supported by the leading scientists in this country. I would not say it was an NGO um, effort. I would say it's a scientific effort um, mm -hmm. because of the great concern for harm. Um, mm -hmm. Right now, a chemical is considered innocent and you have to prove it guilty. But by the time you prove it guilty, it's in all of us, like the PBDEs causing harm. So mm -hmm. if it's an organohalogen flame retardant, let's consider it guilty until it's proven innocent. Mm -hmm. Okay, that sounds reasonable. Okay, next question. What about polyfill pillows as opposed to foam? Is it the same thing with polyfill pillows for that time period, 1976 to 2013, or did TB117 only apply to flexible foam? I think it only applied to flexible foam. Is that right, Dr. Bloom? So I'm not an expert, but I will say that I'm not aware there was a regulation for pillows. The regulation was mm -hmm. for furniture and children's products. And I think um, yeah. when I actually, I, I kind of know this because when I arrived back on the scene, I took a big break from science and came back in about um, 2006. And um, at that point, California was about to enact a similar standard to TB117 for pillows, mattress pads, and comforters. Mm -hmm. And we were able to bring a lot of scientific information to show, again, a lack of benefit and big potential for harm, and they did not. So as far as I know, mm -hmm. there's never been a standard requiring um, pillows or bed coverings to meet a fire fire standard. That doesn't mean that flame retardants weren't used because they were generally used so much in furniture that the leftover furniture was foam was made into other things like that where they weren't required. So I would yeah. say that foam in that generation was suspect, but it wasn't required. And I wouldn't think it would be in other materials. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Next question, uh, does no flame retardant supply to products made in Asia, or could that be another reason to encourage clients to buy locally made products? I think, Arlene, that that labeling law in California is a label on the product no matter where it was made. That's correct. Yeah, good. Next question is, what about wool blends? Do you know how much um, a wool, if it's a, a wool linen, for instance, a Lindsay Woolsey or a wool rayon, how um, much is that going to impede the or accelerate the smolderability of the fabric? Do you know? 
No, and it, again, it's going to depend on the percentage. You know, someone would have to do a bit of research to get that answer. It, it, it yeah, would, well, that leads would, to the next yeah. question. Could I get some suggestions on how to question fabric manufacturers to get them to tell me what is in their backings and surface treatments? Well, I think you can set specifications. Again, this isn't my expertise, but we work with a number of, of big companies. We have a, a material buyers club with Google and Facebook and a lot of big companies that do not want flame retardants in, they want healthy workplaces and they don't want flame retardants in their furniture. Mm -hmm. And I think they specify it. So they say, you know, specification, yeah. no flame retardants. Um, yeah. And I think that's what you have to do is just specify what you want. No PFAS, no flame retardants, no antimicrobial. That would, yeah. you know. And yeah, so I, I will add, Dr. Bloom, that um, designers can ask for the MSDS sheets, the material safety data sheets on specific fabrics. And that is going to give them more information about the chemicals that might have been used in the fiber formulation. Um, and they then they'll have to ask their scientist friends about those particular chemicals because the chemicals themselves are not banned chemicals. So we're not, and this goes back to the um, to Tosca, it's not a banned chemical, so they're they're going to admit that uh, you know they they will report it on their MSDS sheets, and you're just going to have to look harder to find out what the possible health effects of uh, exposure to that chemical are. And Dr. Bloom, you might have some suggestions about it. And I, I guess I'll say that probably the sixclasses.org itself would be a good website to look for more information about some of those chemicals. Do you, do you think Absolutely. So? We, we have a, a lot of information. Yeah. And MSDSs are unfortunately not as useful as they might be. Um, uh -huh. You know, that the, the companies often do not disclose harm, and a lot of times the, the chemical makeup is called confidential business information. So I do yeah. think just specifying that you don't want certain chemicals like flame retardants or PFAS, if you can, it, is more effective than trying to figure out on the MSDS what might be there. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay, you know what we are, we've got time, we're past our time, but we did lose a few minutes in technical difficulties. So we'll do one more question. If products were made in Europe with stricter standards in 1976 to 2013, um, are we sure these had no chemical flame retardants? Um, I think that if they're made in England, they could have had chemical flame retardants. Is that right, Dr. Bloom? Well, so um, only the UK had a requirement, and uh, but other countries there was no flammability requirement. But if they're making things to sell in the US, say if they're making it to sell in California legally, they are required to put in flame retardants. So if yeah, they were manufactured exactly. in Italy for sale in Italy, they're probably fine. Yeah. Um, but if they were manufactured in Italy for the U.S., they probably have flame retardants. Good point. Good point. Dr. Bloom, this has been so, so useful. I know all of us will be making good use of sixclasses.org on ongoingly and we thank you very much for all the expertise you have shared with us well thank you susan for all your passion and good work and i really thank the furniture industry because without collaborating with the industry it might not have been possible to change the standards so um it's been a good partnership and, and I'm very happy to continue. And people feel free to contact me with more questions. I may not always know the answers, but I'll do my best. So. Great, thank you so much. Thank you thank so you. much. So we will look forward to being in touch with you again and our audience is invited to join us again for our next <laughs> webinar too. So.
Thank you very much. Bye now.